The mountains that marked Fort Tuscaness location had grown steadily larger as our day wore on. We were drawing close when Lena called for help from the end of the procession. Doc. Doc, we need your med kit and some water. Eric just collapsed. The old man gripped the bag s straps stretched across his chest as he turned back and ran toward them. Lena moved aside as he reached them. With one foot, Doc dug a rut in the sand and knelt in it beside Eric. He pressed his hand on the boy's forehead and felt at his neck for a pulse. Clear a space here to lay him down. Dig it down about as deep as the rut where I am kneeling, the sand is cooler there, Lena began scooping sand aside and Bem dropped down beside her to help. As they finished, Zu crouched down, grabbing Eric's feet as Dagon helped Doc move his upper body into the cooler spot. I knelt down at the boy's head with a container of cool water. Doc untied the loose wrap around his own neck and head, soaking it with the water. Then he placed it on Eric's face and neck, moving it around slowly to cool and dampen his skin. The others sat Eric up slightly as I poured a small sup of water. Doc took it from me. Trickling a small bit into the boy's mouth. His moistened tongue moved a bit, and he began speaking deliriously in unrecognizable words and phrases. Doc stripped off his own outer robe as he addressed the group that had gathered. Give him some shade. Take this and block the suns. We all stood up, grabbing a place on the garment, stretching it out taut to create a shadow that fell across them both. Doc gave Eric another small sip of water. Immediately noting the cooling effect of the shade. As we continued taking care of Eric. Sandy pushed ahead to the top of the next dune. He caught sight of something ahead and ducked down suddenly, falling flat to the sand, careful to remain hidden behind the ridge line. He slowly raised his head up to peer over the dune's crest. In the valley beyond lay the exposed base of the jagged, towering hills. Between us and them sat Fort Tuscan. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. A small group of freighters, loosely assembled in an unmoving cluster, lay adrift far above a massive green and blue planet smeared with dense white and gray clouds. A squadron of snubship fighters drifted between them with engines off. A short distance from them, a lone freighter, the Elantrid, sat at a full stop after having limped a fair distance to reach the orbital platform she was now moored alongside. From the far side of the platform, a lone X-wing fighter suddenly appeared from within the black as it reverted from hyperspace. Immediately upon its appearance, the engines of all ships in the fighter squadron roared to life, propelling half of them away from the freighters to intercept the inbound ship, and maneuvering the remaining half into a defensive posture around them. As they approached it, a voice sounded in their headsets from the newcomer's fighter. Commander Nera, this is Commander Skywalker. Reekan informed me of your status and asked that I check on your situation as I passed near the system, a moment later Nera's voice came over the comm. Renegade flight, stand down. I repeat, stand down. Nice to hear from you Luke. We've a got a freighter undergoing repairs that shouldn't t take much longer. We could use another set of eyes and sensors if you've a got the time, we re pretty vulnerable sitting out here, roger that. Commander. I ll stay with you until you are clear to continue on. Luke maneuvered his ship toward the other fighters and cut his engines, drifting slowly into their formation. R2 electronically mumbled his disapproval. Orbiting silently and invisibly. Deep in the haze and ionic distortion of Dara IV's upper atmosphere, a small ship took notice of the gathering. Asterisk 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 chapter 35 staying the course. Taking advantage of a brief reprieve from the storms that had raged across the frozen surface of Hoth. Mon Mothma ambled through the defensive trenches roughly cut into the snow and ice outside the base. The seemingly endless wailing of the winds had finally given way to still, clear blue skies and sunlight. The spiked deck plates beneath her boots had been dropped haphazardly into all of the trenches, creating a more stable path than the bare snow and ice afforded. Rebel troops hurried around her, moving supplies, guns and energy cables to key positions along the trench and to the many turret gun arrays that made up the outer defenses. Her personal guard detail trailed silently behind. Noticing that today she was more disconnected than usual. Quieter, more distant. Although fairly young. Alia had been her aide for years and had not only known the duties her position required, but also the proper manner and behavior required among any dignitaries she might encounter. The guards mourned the loss of her as well. Alia was so young. 
So much loss and pain had been endured by so many. Darkness had somehow wormed its way in. Rotting the core of the Senate, choking out everything the Republic had been. She suddenly realized how quiet it was. All the troops had moved on to forward areas and were gone, she was alone in the trenches, staring out across the ice fields. The Emperor must be stopped. She thought. If he and Vader had built one station capable of destroying planets. They could build more, if they hadnt already. Tears streamed down her face, burning on her cheek in the frigid air as the faces of her friends Bale and Breha appeared in her mind's eye, both gone in an instant along with the rest of Alderaan, while their daughter watched helplessly. Mon continued to wander ahead of the guards, openly weeping now. Asterisk. Inside the base. Yan walked the frozen corridors in search of the princess. Their meeting had been both abrupt and awkward, and she feared the wrong first impression had been made. She sensed something between Leia and Solo, and did not want to, in any way, be seen as an obstacle. She made a turn into a dim hall lined with doors on one side. As she moved through the narrow corridor, she heard music flowing from within one of them. It stopped her in her tracks, the sudden recognition. She closed her eyes, listening as she turned back toward the door. It was the unmistakably beautiful strains of the royal anthem of Alderaan. She retraced her steps and knocked softly on the door, waiting for a response. The music played on and she heard no movement from within. She knocked again, harder this time. Almost immediately the music fell silent, after which the door opened slightly. Torin Far's face appeared in the narrow crack of the open door. It was obvious from her puffy face and red eyes that she had been crying. I am sorry, did the music disturb you? No, not at all. I didnt mean to intrude. Said Yan, pausing briefly. Did you have friends there? On Alderaan, fresh tears fell down Torin's cheeks. Family she sobbed. My entire family was there, my whole world. I was off planet on my way to Talisee when, she hesitated. When it happened. The retired royal handmaiden from Naboo took a shallow breath, giving a moment of silent solemnity to the memory of those lost and then reached out, gently wiped Torin's tears from her face. I can still remember hearing that music for the first time, as a child. My father was a diplomat, and had brought my mother and me along on one of his many trips to Alderaan. He said he wanted to expose me to its rich art and culture. She closed her eyes briefly. I can still smell the sweetness of the air, hear the anthem as the royal procession made its way through the streets, open for all to see. I could feel the energy that emanated from the people and indeed. The very planet itself. I returned many times over the years both in a business capacity and for pleasure, spending days wandering the capital city, taking in the architecture and art. I mourn it from a different place, but mourn it all the same. She could see the pain across Torin's face. You know dear. I know someone who shares your personal attachment and loss, someone here in this base. The Princess Leia Organa has been a secret leader of the Alliance for some time now. She lost her entire family as well, and is the last member of the Royal House of Alderaan. I was actually looking for her when I heard the music. I know she shares your pain, and probably HASNT allowed herself to grieve, or hear that sweet anthem in some time. Why don't you come with me, and we ll find her together, Torin nodded as she wiped away the last of her tears. She disappeared for a moment. Quickly returning with her parka. Yan put her arm around the young girl's shoulders and closed the door as they walked away in search of the princess. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, beneath the endless depths of the black. Star-filled Tatooine night. Falker and Topolev lay flat out on the sand, each with a set of macrobinoculars, peering over the crest of the dune they lay on. The lenses rotated back and forth slightly, moving in and out with the hushed whirring of tiny electric motors, as they worked to focus on the guards stationed just outside Fort Tuscan. Topolev noticed that with this closer look, the outer shell of the Tuscan head wraps was pretty grotesque. The bandages that wrapped their heads were dry-rotted, tattered and frayed from years in the harsh Tatooine elements and obscured any direct view of the creatures beneath. He lowered his macros, looking down toward the fort with his own, unaided eyes. I think Rogue was right, to set camp where we did, Falker nodded slightly as he replied, still looking at the electronic image in the eyepieces of his macros. With Eric trying to get his strength back, and us being this close to the fort, it made sense for Sandy to suggest it to him. 
Tomorrow morning we LL have to keep a close watch on that herd, though. He pointed to the far right corner of the fort where they were gathered. Tops looked in that direction. Nodding in agreement as Falker switched off his binoculars and slipped them back into their case. Now it s up to them said Topolev, somehow I never imagined the course of a mission would be directed by following a herd of banthas, Falker grinned a little as he pushed himself up to his knees. It s time for D. Drag and Blade to take over watch for us. I'll go back and send them up to relieve you, Topolev nodded as Falker stood up and headed back to the group, leaving him alone on the dune. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. A split second after visually confirming the fugitive across the room against the wanted poster displayed inside his visor, a calm settled over him. His pulse began to slow, and his breathing became rhythmic and measured as he waited. The man he watched ordered a drink for himself and the woman beside him. The noisy bar was thick with smoke, and patrons busily shouting out their bets on various races and sporting events being broadcast on large screens around the room. There were many people between him and the man across the room, so he waited. He waited for the crowd to thin and finally part, giving him a clean shot. As it did, he immediately raised the custom EE-3 rifle, snugging the stock up against his shoulder and adjusting a setting before taking aim. Relaxing, he squeezed the trigger slowly between breaths, between heartbeats. The boisterous, raucous crowd was suddenly silenced by the blast discharged from his weapon. When the barrel of his gun stopped smoking, he laid it gently across the crook of his left elbow and silently made his way across the room. The woman seated at the table stared wide-eyed at the Mandalorian warrior as he approached, tears streamed down her face, and her body shook uncontrollably with shock and fear. The fugitive and most of the table he stood beside had suffered a direct hit from his broad spectrum. Wide-angle disintegration blast. Both the man and the furniture had been instantly incinerated, and yet both retained their shape. The blackened man stood unmoving beside the charred table. Fett slowly turned his head to the woman, uttering only a single word. Go, the terrified woman slipped out of her seat and ran off into the crowd. The bounty hunter cocked his head to one side and reached out, touching the man on his shoulder. As he did, what had been the man fell forward into the table, both collapsing to the floor in a silent cascade of ashes. Fett took a step closer, wiped away the fine ashes that had settled on his gauntlets and chest armor, and knelt. He ran his gloved fingers through the ash pile, searching for something he could use to identify his victim. Except for a few bone fragments and the molten remains of a small sidearm. There was nothing left. Images of the races and games flickered overhead on video monitors, announcers busily commenting and crowds cheering. Other than those voices, the room was silent, and all eyes were on him. He retrieved a small transparent vial from one of his belt pouches. Dropping three of the bone shards inside before scooping up a bit of the ash. He pressed a stopper in place, sealing the container as he stood up. The stunned crowd silently parted, clearing a path to the door. If this unlucky guy had seen him first, he might have run, but he would have just prolonged the inevitable and died tired. The Holonet wanted poster that bore his image had clearly stated dead or alive. With that said, Fett knew all too well that Vader and the Emperor savored their trophies. Shortly after his father's death, the new Emperor had given him a job, and paid handsomely for it. His first bounty had been the recovery of the broken and defeated body of Jedimaster Mace Windu. He had struggled with and dragged the almost unrecognizable corpse of his father's murderer from the dirty back streets of the surface of Coruscant. He dragged it in to claim his money and give the Emperor the first of many dead to occupy the grisly trophy room for slain Jedi beneath his carbonite prisoner meditation garden. Since then, there had been so many others. Some bodies returned, some just ashes like this latest victim. Over the years. Vader had been none too happy about receiving a pile of ashes for expected payment. The Dark Lord had a macabre need to see the bodies. He knew most of the victims, he needed to see that they were dead. The bones rattled as he shook the vial and slipped it back in his belt pouch. The Empire would just have to identify the bone chips on this one. He passed through the door out into the cool night air, thinking to himself. Spotting and identifying this loser had been the first favorable turn of events since his ship had been damaged on Yavin IV as he watched Solo slip away. 
The repair team he de brought in had found the mangled outrigger torn off during pursuit of the Falcon, but they cool DNT make repairs in the jungle. It took some time. But they were finally able to recalibrate the one remaining outrigger to stabilize a short flight. After limping here to Vorid V the real repairs had begun. Fabrication of custom replacement parts were necessary, but taking too much time. He was losing money in unclaimed bounties. Until the ship was finished he knew there was little he could do, and had resigned himself to being stranded until repairs were complete. Thankfully, that time was almost upon him. Too attractive. Blue-skinned dancers passed by, eyeing him as he stepped into the street. He turned his head to admire them. He de spent most of his time waiting in the bars and casinos, luckily his weakness for TWI Lex made it bearable. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. At some point in the still blackness of the pre-dawn hours, nightmares of Beliran V had once again awakened rogue, terrifying nightmares of suffocation and death, trapped beneath endless piles of dead Ethorians. Unable to shake the memories and images from his head, he got up and set to work, anxious for the next day to begin so we could be on our way. He filled the time while everyone else slept by leading the Eopies up from the pit, and raising the half-buried repulsor sleds to the surface. He fed and watered the animals, harnessing them to the sleds, readying them for the coming day. Now everyone was awake and preparing to leave. There could be no fires or fusion furnaces this close to the fort, no detectable heat plumes could be risked. ETZ chewed on a high-energy ration bar and tossed one to Rogue as he walked by, heading for the forward dune position. He unwrapped it, and took a bite as he looked back over the men under his command and the civilians along for the ride. Diffused light had begun to chase away the darkness as daybreak drew nearer, but the suns had not yet risen, and in the ambience of the pre-dawn light, the sand beneath our feet took on a mystical glow. Dagon packed his bag. Never taking his eyes off Rogue as he made his way through the camp checking everyone's progress, continuing on to the forward dune. D. Drag. 0600 and I were lining up the Eopies and sleds when Blade appeared, striding over the forward dune sandy crest heading toward Rogue, the herd s awake and some are starting to wander off. We need to get moving if we re going to follow them, but we need to do it quietly. He turned toward the mountains that rose up behind the fort. You see that linear dune over there? Indicating a sandy ridgeline winding to the left side of the fort. It goes past the mountains out to the open desert beyond. Several banthas were already heading along the side facing the fort, Rogue nodded. Yes. I see what you mean. That LL give us perfect cover. We LL follow on the back side of that dune line until we re beyond the mountains. You and D Drake keep the herd in sight as they head that way. We LL catch up to you once we re out in the open. Keep your comlinks on, yes, sir, Blade turned and disappeared over the dune as Rogue motioned ETZ. 0600 and D drag over to him. They assembled around him. Get everyone ready to be on our way. We re leaving in five minutes. We LL be moving along the far side of that dune line. He indicated the ridge that snaked out to the open desert. Tell them we re all to maintain absolute silence until we re beyond the mountains. Move it, yes, sir replied D drag, and they scattered. Asterisk. We had been walking in silence for a little over an hour when 4120 and Rogue, broke away from the head of the group, climbing to the top of the dune. The rest of us stopped walking while they moved up to check our position. They peered over the crest of the dune, spotting D. Drag and Blade just ahead. Beyond them, a group of banthas lumbered into the open dunefield of the sea. As far beyond them as could be seen, the crests and valleys of countless dunes rose and fell, disappearing into the rippling heat waves off near the horizon. The rest of the caravan crossed over the ridge, falling in line with D. Drag and Blade behind the slow-moving herd. Dagon and Ash kept a close eye on the troops ahead as they cautiously spoke in hushed tones. Ash looked away toward the open desert. Well, W-A-S-N-T that the plan. Lay low with no communication, Dagon kept walking, staring straight ahead, eyeing Rogue carefully. Yes. I mean. I know the mission was a success, they destroyed the station, but everyone in my strike team was supposed to have been contacted by now, give it time said Ash, that mission generated a lot of heat. That s all got to die down, Dagon shook his head. I just have a bad feeling about it. It was our job to steal the information and pass it to Wave 2 on Toprawa. 
After that, we scattered and hid, just like we planned. Wave 2 transmitted the data to the Alliance from there and were supposed to disappear for a while and then signal everyone in Wave 1. Something must have gone wrong, otherwise I'd have heard from Bria by now. I just hope. Ash quietly shushed him as ETZ came walking past toward the rear of the column. Both continued walking in silence. The hours silently slipped by as we followed the herd further and further into the sea. It was mid-afternoon when I turned back to check our progress against a landmark, only to discover that the mountains and fort were almost completely gone from view. I pulled the stopper from my canteen and took a drink. I never had cared for the water from my backpack, and as long as I had fresh water. I.D. decided to drink that first. A fine spray of sand whipped across the ground, forming and reforming delicate ripple patterns on the untouched landscape. Most of the dunes out here in the open were hundreds of meters tall, more like sandy foothills than mere dunes. This place was as raw and beautiful as it was deadly. Toward the middle of the procession, between two of the sleds. Falker walked quietly beside Lena. Finally he looked over to her and broke the silence with a question. So, do you know anything about that fort? I thought the Tuscan raiders were cave dwellers. Did they build that place? No began Lena, shaking her head. The sand people didn't build it, they stole it. Part of my research here is Gorfa history, Gorfa, asked Falker. She grinned. Gorfa is the proper name of their race, but they renown as sand people for obvious reasons. She brushed her hair from her face. Trying to distill everything she knew about them down to a concise, yet interesting level. The fort itself was actually built by settlers from Bestine IV, who named it Fort Tuscan after an island on their homeworld. A wind gust blew her hair into her face. She reached up, brushing it away as they continued walking. About two years after it was built, the Gorfa clans united and led raiding parties to the fort, assaulting and battering it. The attacks were relentless and went on for nearly three years until the settlers finally abandoned it, nice of them to be so friendly said Falker, it was those attacks that earned the sand people the nickname Tuscan Raiders, she continued, briefly during the Galactic Civil War they lost control of the fort to a group of moisture farmers and the mercenaries they had hired to help recapture the fort. Unfortunately, it was short-lived. A union of the Gorfa clans mercilessly attacked in numerous waves and reclaimed the fort, stopping in her tracks, she looked off across the sand, then over to Murin, actually, would you like to hear a recording of one of those moisture farmers, sure, said Falker, wondering what she might produce from her bag. Murin. Murin, come here she called out. Murin stopped walking and just waited for them to catch up to her. Hey, do you have the sound clip I jacked out of that recorder? Remember, asked Lena, jacked out. Asked Falker. Lena smiled again and Murin rolled her eyes as she reached into her bag and handed over the recorder. Yeah, we were looking through some stuff at a Jawa junk sale when I found it. They wanted way too much for the beat up old recorder, but I really wanted the message ID found on it, so while Murin distracted them. I jacked in and moved the file over to her recorder. He flashed a reproachful look. What, she asked innocently. The message has historical value, and they can still sell the recorder. No harm done. She selected the recording from a menu and pressed the button to play it. Nothing happened. There was no sound at all. She pressed the play button again several times, but the recording would not begin. Did you break the recorder? Murin. I can t get it to play now. The silence that followed was broken by Rogue as he walked back along the line of people, addressing everyone. An old bull and cow have stopped to bed down for the night. The rest of their herd is moving on without them. We re going to stop here for the night and follow the older members tomorrow. They re our best bet of being led to the recording. He continued on past them, giving the directions again for those further down the line. Frustrated, Lena stuffed the recorder in her bag. I ll look at it once we get settled down for the night. When I figure out what's wrong with it, we can listen, D. Drag and Deckard have been working on an astromech back at our base. I am sure they could help with it if you want. She nodded as they headed forward to the selected campsite. Asterisk. Rogue connected the comlink to the pulsing fusion generator and switched it on. There was no static, no sound at all. He looked at it disgusted. 4120, who stood beside him offered an observation. It probably has to be charged to work. 
Not actively being charged, Rogue switched it off and laid it beside the generator. ILL let it sit overnight and try them again in the morning, Topolev poked at the dying fire in the center of camp, and added another compressed fuel core. The hour was late when D. Drag finally managed to get Murinus' recorder to work. Lena hugged him enthusiastically, grabbed the recorder and invited him to watch. He followed her over to where Falker was stretched out. It s working. D. Drag got it to work she said excitedly. There s no hollow image or even a video feed, only audio, but it gets the point across. The two troopers watched as Lena selected the recording from a menu, pressed a button and the rough. Static-filled recording began to play. I cocked my head to one side and listened to the nearly forgotten voice on the recording. We've finally managed to fight off the remaining sand people from Fort Tuscan. As the last one fell. I was overwhelmed with profound pride as the fortress had at last been recovered from the hands of the foul murderers who have soiled its halls for so long. I look forward to sending word to. What's this, another wave of Tuscan raiders has appeared. They seem to fight with renewed vigor and have reinforced their numbers with much more powerful warriors this time. Perhaps my thoughts of victory are far too premature. At that point, the recording completely filled with static and stopped. We all sat in silence, mentally replaying the snippet in our heads, realizing the moisture farmer's captured words were probably his last. You three should get some rest I said, settling back down on my bedroll. Morning comes early out here, and we move out when the Banthas do, Lena nodded. D. Drag helped her up, and they each went back to their makeshift beds. A brief slash of light seared across the sky overhead. Without thinking. I made a wish, the way my parents had shown me when I was little. I opened my eyes, staring at the darkness where the light had been, memories of that faraway place and person flooding in. Closing my eyes. I willed myself to sleep. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, chapter 36 unforeseen. It was somewhere between mid-morning and noon and the heat was already reaching near unbearable levels. The Bantha's course had been parallel with a chain of hills to our left, following the ridgeline to stay up where the air was moving. A change in the dune pattern forced man and beast alike to climb the high sandy mounds and descend into the deathly still valleys between them, the heat of which very nearly sucked the breath from your lungs. What little reprieve we had seen in recent days had abated in favor of more tortuous temperatures. We in the 104th were somewhat protected by thermal suits, but our guide and the civilian entourage of archaeologists lacking such equipment required more frequent stops to rest, cool down and take a drink. Fluids were flowing out of them almost as quickly as they were being replaced. We pressed on until just beyond midday, when the suns began their customary decline in the afternoon sky. This time we stopped for water and lunch. As the others relaxed under makeshift shades and pulled food rations and water from the supply sleds. I took a good long look at where we were, not just the next foot placement ahead in the sand. I shielded my eyes and turned completely around, realizing that the mountains, all landmarks of any kind for that matter, had seemingly fallen off the edge of the planet and we were very much alone, adrift in the sea. We were midway up the slowly inclined slope of a dune with limited visibility directly ahead, but there was only sand as far as you could see in any other direction. 0600 and 4120 watered the animals, then made their way to the food and water station set up by ETZ. I slipped my canteen under the water nozzle and filled the container to the top, grabbed a ration bag and sat down in the sand with my back against the back of the supply sled. I had just taken a drink and bitten off the second piece of Ronto jerky when a small swarm of tiny, sand-colored animals came racing over the ridge of the dune, down its face, and straight through our small group of travelers without so much as a second thought. Murin and Lena quickly clambered on top of one of the sleds to get away from them. Zoo just unholstered her pistol and took several shots at them, little sand plumes spraying up where the mist blast points hit. Sandy was laughing hysterically at the little creatures and dancing around to the strains of unheard music flowing through his head. Scareers, yelled 0600. He quickly pulled the rifle off his shoulder and squeezed off several shots, hitting nearly as many of the tiny beasts. That LL tastes a lot better than this protein bar, that s for sure, Scareers, I asked. He looked over my way. Yeah. You haven't seen them around the spaceport, I shook my head. 
No, they re basically desert rats, but pretty tasty when cooked properly grinned 0600 as he took aim again. Usually they steer clear of humans he said. Turning to eye the dune they had come scampering over. I wonder what they were running away from in such a hurry. He lowered his rifle without firing again. 